sub five fans. Oh yeah. What's up, Fight Fans and YouTube family? Uh, can you hear me out there loud and clear? And when you're joining in, could you let me know that you could hear the audio loud and clear? We have a lot to talk about on this episode right here. Um, I want to touch up on a few points. Uh, about Subria Matias and his next upcoming opponent, Liam, um, and what's been going on behind the scenes with um, Rivera and Rivera's dad and Salsa and, um, you know, what was said and stuff, you know, and ironically, you know, I saw, you know, all the back and forth and I happened to be a part of it. And, um, you know, I, I I saw it firsthand, you know, unfold, uh, so to speak. You know, I wasn't a part of it in, in the sense that, you know, I was in it with them, but uh, I saw it unfold. So, um, interesting enough, though, you know, with everything that is being said, no matter what Rivera's team says, no matter what Subria's team is saying right now, let's look at the facts and let's look at the both fighters, right? And I started to ask myself, is this one of those cases where Rivera is um, trying to slide in his fighter, right, by shit talking? Does he really deserve a fight with Subriel? And is Subriel in the position in his career where he should accept the, such a fight? Do we want to see Subriel fight another fighter for really no le legacy? You're just giving this guy a, a shot at your title another title defense. In fact, Subriel Matias' record right now, uh, he's 20 and 20. He has 20 fights, 20 knockouts. He has one loss. He has a 100% knockout ratio, meaning if you fight him, it's probably 100% of the time he's going to knock you out, okay? So, very dangerous man, very dangerous opponent. Okay, uh, he's 5'8", he's 31 years old. And that right there is what I find interesting. He's 31 years old, right? Okay. Do we want to see Subria Matias against Rivera? Like, or do we want to see him in legacy fights for world titles? If we can get some of these chances, these champions to give him a chance to unify. OK, now that's when you start to stand in a different category of champions where, yes, you became champion, but a unified world champion. Now, that meaning that, you know, you potentially could be top dog in that division. When Rivera started coming into the picture, right, Ironically enough, I went to a uh, boxing record, and in fact, I'm there right now, and I'm currently looking at it, right? So, Blair Matias' is next fight in Puerto Rico, June 15th, which we, we all know is supposed to be against Liam Peru in, uh, in Puerto Rico. It's not on the schedule, meaning the fight hasn't even been announced yet. The tickets haven't even went on sale for the Liam fight. And Rivera's already trying to secure himself a fight after this fight. I believe if a bigger offer is presented to Sabria Matias's team, um, he should take it. And you know what Salsa's going to say? Oh, he's ducking my son now. Now he doesn't want to fight my son. Well, in fact, let's look at your son's record. Let's look at Michelle Ali's record. Okay. Let's see what he's done in his career. He has 25 fights, 14 knockouts with one loss, right? Um, um Sergio Lippin, Lippin is, it was his last fight, and he won that fight in a 10-round fight, and he won by unanimous decision. The fight before that was the Frank Martin fight, which, in fact, he lost, and it, 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 it marked his first career loss. Frank Martin came into that fight 16-0. and 0. 
and he beat Rivera on that night. The toughest thing Rivera has ever won in his entire boxing career, right? At 135 pounds, he won an IBF USBA light um, vacant title. That's one of those alphabet belts. It's, uh, in fact, a little bit like under a regular interim world champion. If you was to be like the regular interim champion, an interim championship belt would be better than that belt right there. In fact, yeah, it, that's a, like a real, real, you know, but it's a kind of belt you do want your fighter to see if he can get that belt at least, you see, and then go from there, okay? But with only that being on his record, does Rivera really deserve a shot to fight a fighter like Subir Matias? Now, Subir Matias has been criticized for not fighting anyone in his division or doing anything, right? Okay, so let's just check out Subriel Matias and what he did in his division, right? Okay, so Subriel um, last fight obviously was at 140, right? Where he he uh, made a title defense on his IBF world title. 140, he has his last fight. The fight after that, he has at 140. The fight after that, at 140. The fight after that was at 140. The fight after that was at 140. The fight after that was at 142. The fight after that was at 140. The fight after that was at 140. The fight after that was at 140. The f Wait a minute. His entire career has been at 140 and above. Where he started at 140, 145, one, and then the 143, and then went from there, his second fight, he basically fought his entire career at 140. How the fuck are you saying he hasn't done nothing at 140? He's the best fighter. He's a real 140-pounder. He's the only real 140-pounder champion right now, currently. Now, they're trying to give um, um, Teofimo Lopez a lot of credit for beating Josh Taylor. Right. And the narrative is he beat Joss Taylor and Josh Taylor had four belts. That record's going to scratch, homeboy. Check this out. Here's here's the harsh reality. What did Josh Taylor go into that fight? The WBO champion. How many belts did he have on that night? Only one. So how the hell am I going to give him credit for four belts? Oh, nobody beat him. He was stripped. That's nobody problem but himself. I can't give him credit for what he didn't have. So when he entered that night against Teofimo Lopez, he only entered with one belt. And the fight prior to that, watch out, many people felt he, like he lost. So Josh Taylor was already on a decline, and it showed, right? Teofimo Lopez got that win, but all he did was win one belt. That's like when he cried wolf and tried to say that he was an undisputed world champion. He had all four belts. Never had all four belts. He only had three. Just like George Camboza. Right? We've been down that road. Right? Okay. So, when you're looking at who's done the most at 140 pounds, hands down, Subria Matias has fought the who's who's. Now, when it comes to household names is what they're trying to give them credit for. They're saying that Devin Haney has fought more household names. But wait a minute. He fought those guys at 135 pounds. He fought them at 135 pounds. What does that got to do with 140 pounds? I can't give you credit for that. Everything you did at 135, from the moment you step at 140, that's a new day. That's a new division. You have to write your legacy as you go. You see? It's what you did there. How many times have we seen champions try to move up one weight division, get knocked the fuck out, go back down, and the next fight, what does the announcer say? Well, at this weight division, nobody beat him. He's the best here. See? See how that works? You're judged by your division. So all this, who Devin Haney fought or whatever, kudos to him. But from the moment he walked into the 140, that was it. So Brian Matias is the best 140-pounder there is in the world, and he is the best among those champions. Doesn't matter what anybody else did in whatever division, 
No, it's what you did for me lately, sport. You see? And that's what he has to, that's what we're judging him on. That's all I could judge him on. I really don't think that this Rivera fight should happen after this fight right here. No, because Sobriel, his stock is on a up. Fighting Rivera does what? What does Rivera bring to the table? He doesn't bring any belts. All he brings is a big mouth dad. That's it. And I get it. Yo, Rivera got a little bit of skills. He tried to get slick and say that um, Rivera um, got Subriel Matia in the boxing and that bo and then Subriel got him on the power a little bit so that it balances off. I'm like, wait a minute. Just because your son looks like that doesn't mean that his boxing skill is more superior than Subriel's boxing skill. No, they just don't look the same. But make no mistake, Subria Matias' his boxing skills are very effective. So effective, in fact, he's the IBF world champion. And your son's never become a world champion. That's how effective his skills are. So I'm just saying, I'm speaking the truth, okay? A lot of these guys want a free ride to the top. They'll say anything to get somebody to turn around and give them a shot. You see? But Subria Matias really got to be smart about this. I know that the, some things were said back and forth, and now it kind of he feels like it ties him into it, but he owes them nothing. He really doesn't. He doesn't owe them shit. So if he turns around and just be like, sees a better opportunity, you know, I feel like he should take it. You know? Um... There can be some moving pieces going around in the 140. Roley and, and Eastside Pitbull Cruz is still a 50-50. That's still a 50-50 for me. That can go either way. I can see that Roley could beat him because he could be the bigger man. And the way they blimped up Cruz to come up there to the 140, he doesn't belong there. You see? So, um, you know, although I, I think Roley's going to show some improvement in his fight game, and he might be able to take in Esau Pitbull Cruz's little punches there, bro. And, uh, you know, break down. Esau Pitbull Cruz is not the most technical of punches. He's more of a of a brawler, you know. So um, I think that uh, um, Roley is a brawler type dude. And that fight is right up his alley. Where that he might be able to connect against Esau Pitbull Cruz. Uh, watch out. Roley might drop him, bro. I'm trying to tell you guys. So if he holds on to that belt, that'll be very interesting of who his choice of opponent would be. You know, being that Ryan Garcia seems like he's going to make it to this fight with Devin Haney, you know, and uh, Shakur Stevenson um, is just seems for me has been making the wrong moves every day. You know, uh, Shakur st needs to lock down an opponent and really uh, give the fans uh, a, a great fight due to his last fight so that the fans can um, put him back in the category where they once held him at. Um, over that fight, over Edwin, uh, a lot of people were like, man, Shakur, you really didn't look good, you know? And uh, I, no matter what the excuse was on that night, I always say this, did you take the fight? Did you get in the ring? You're responsible for, for the fight. That's it. You see? So, um... Look, I, I don't know how you guys feel. You know, I, I know, although at the end of the day, the back and forth with Subria Matia and, and, and Rivera is entertaining. Um, they said some things back and forth. I feel like um, they should, like, just, like, let it go right now until um, Subria has Liam in front of him. It would be a disrespect to overlook your opponent. I believe that he needs to talk about Liam right now, give Liam all the credit that he deserves. So when he beats Liam, he gets the credit of beating an undefeated fighter and a WBO interim global champion. That's how close Liam is of being champion, that he's a real interim champion. He has a piece of Tiafima Lopez's title is what Liam has. He has a piece of, he's supposed to be technically fighting Teal. You know, um, Teal um, should have fought Liam in Honduras, kind of. You know, that's basically what should have had happen, okay? Um, as you can see, Terrence Crawford was rumored to fight Kill Brook, right? And that was a lie. 
a lot of people came on and 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 then they tracked the story back and where it's originated from was where that Kell Brook had posted on his social media platform that it was like a possibility fight and it took off from there. Terrence Crawford in his camp is denied all, you know, no, they're not. In fact, Terrence Crawford is looking to fight his next fight at 154. He's looking to become a champion at 154 and fight for one of those belts, seeing that they stripped um, Jamel Charlo or all four belts. Going after Saul Canelo Alvarez, I said it, it cost him everything. On that night, he thought he, he was going to get a big payday, but at the end of the day, it cost him all four belts and no man beat him in the ring for those belts. That should like really fuck with you. Or you, if you're going to make a comeback, you will be making a comeback and be being announced as the former champion of that division and no one beat you. And you're still active. In your prime. Hmm. Talk about losing it all. Yeah. And uh, we have another another interesting fight coming out for four belts. We have Naoya Inoue, the Japanese superstar. And if you don't know too much about him, I know that when I first heard of this Japanese guy, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, for many, many years um, in boxing, when... The boxers came from Europe and from Japan, from China, from anywhere out there, anywhere but really Mexico. It was like, you know, when they were champion over there, they would they would like take the belt and play keep away and not want to fight our guys. And they would just want to give like their guys in their country their fight. And I can understand that. And that's cool. But in America, we we knew that we were leading the way. And if you wanted to be considered a real world champion, a month's world champions, this wasn't a rule. This is not a technical thing. This is just amongst the champions that if you can successfully come to America and beat all the American champions, they would give you the nod. You would gain their respect, so to speak. So when I heard of this Japanese guy, they told me his size. They told me what weight division he was fighting in. And I got to be honest with you. I found it very hard to believe. And I said to myself, yeah, he's good. But he's good over there. He's good against those guys. Not against, you know, like American guys. Then, little by little, he started fighting Mexicans, Puerto Ricans. He started venturing out to uh, the British he started, he came to New York City, not once, but twice. Um, and he started fighting some of the top guys. Not only did he start to make a lot of noise, but he became champion on his sixth professional fight. And I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. And then he became a two division champion in only eight professional fights. I lifted my eyebrow. I was like, hmm, that's pretty interesting. That's not easy to do. But yet I wasn't impressed. I wasn't impressed until the day he came in the ring against Emmanuel Rodriguez. And on that night, I was sure that Emmanuel Rodriguez was going to beat this five foot five, 118 pound Japanese guy. I mean, when you took a look at him, I say it to this day, he had the best disguise in all of boxing. When you look at him, he doesn't look like that killer. But make no mistake, he transformed when he enters that ring. The fighters have even spoke of it, his aura, his presence, and his um, confidence of, of, of taking control of the fight is like overwhelming. And the fact that he can back it up with his speed, his power, his footwork, and he always seems to be in the right position at the right time to throw the right punch. Most of the time, he has most of his opponents shelling up and running, trying to survive in there. He's a really dominant force. But when he really entered the, when he really got my attention is when he entered that World Series of Boxing, when he won the Covenant Muhammad Ali Trophy, which I mind you, it was the first trophy in the tournament. 
And he won that tournament. He showed real class in that tournament because behind the scenes, Donaire had promised his kids that he would bring him the trophy back. And the Japanese superstar allowed him to take the trophy for a little while with his kids and take pictures and stuff with the trophy because he knew at the end of the day, we're brothers in boxing. And at the end of the day, it's always respect. It's combat. Yeah, I want to beat you. But you gain my respect in that ring. There's nothing like two men going inside of a ring and really get gaining another man's respect. You see, sometimes when fighters view other fighters, we're cocky, we're arrogant, and we're only seeing the flaws in that fighter. We make ourselves get angry at that fighter and we find the littlest things to boost us even on that night. But after the fight, we have to admit, the man that was standing in front of us brought the best out of us. And there's no better feeling on that night of those kind of fights. I have had fights and later on, and you know, maybe not that day, but in days you know, to follow, I, I ran into him and I was like, yo, what's up? You know, you want to go out, have lunch or whatever? And uh, I sat down and got to know the dude and and uh, we ended up being pretty cool and shit because he gained my respect. Other than that, I probably would have never talked to dude, you know, because that was the only way you was going to get my respect when I was living that life. And a lot of these fighters lived that life. This Japanese star is a real class act in a lot of different ways. Even when they went and um, announced Terrence Crawford as the pound-for-pound pound fighter, and the world was like, wow, how much more does he have to do? Do you not know that he also unified all four belts in two separate weight division, and it only took him six months to do it? It took Terrence Crawford a little over six and a half years to do that. It took him six months. It's ridiculous. And in the same year he did it, that it took him six months to do it, they still gave Terrence Crawford the pound for pound list. You know what kind of class act this guy is? He went out and acknowledged and gave Terrence Crawford the nod and said, yes, you're pound for pound. And one day I want to be like you. Knowing that his accomplishments have been much more, much more impressive than Terrence Crawford. But he doesn't want to go back and forth, and he's not going to draw straws. What the Japanese guy is saying, I'll try to win you over. He knows he has some big moments and big fights, but now the cat is out of the bag, and everybody kind of knows who he is. Look, in all my years of boxing, I've studied a lot of fights, and in fact, Today, in fact, I was looking over tape with Subriel Matias, and I was watching fight after fight after fight. And at the same time, like I remind you, I'm never biased. I don't take fighter sides, right? And as I was watching them, I was also watching ways of how to beat them. Who would beat them? And my measuring stick is I can only measure it by the fighters that are currently active right now at 140. Meaning my measuring stick isn't by a fantasy island fight that I build fighter that I build in my head. I could devise a way to beat him, but if no one fights like that, then that's not what it's gonna take. So I started looking at his fights real closely and I started to notice that Sobre Matias does have good footwork and he has good understanding. But he he he's the type of fighter that wants you to stand in front of him. I noticed that there was a lot of fighters that started off well from um, bouncing and moving like Ponce. Ponce was moving a lot until Subir Matias slowed his ass down and he had no choice but to stand in front of him. Once Subriel had him standing in front of him, it was just a matter of time. It was just a matter of time from there. So I was like, okay. What kind of style it would take to beat him? And in fact, my memory went all, about, all the way back to one particular fight. One fight and the way I saw the fight play out. It was Roberto Duran against Sugar Ray Leonard 2. The way Sugar Ray, the way Sugar Ray Leonard frustrated Roberto Duran on that night the way he moved around him, 
the way he kept peppering him with his jab, giving him good power shots and spinning out, never allowing his back to touch the ropes. The way he frustrated and tormented with Duran on that night, it would be something similar to that to beat Subriel. Then out of all the fighters at the 140 pound, I started to break down who has such skill or even remotely close to a Sugar Ray. I don't think anybody looks like Sugar Ray, but let's see who breaks down who's the closest. And the only fighter that came to mind was Devin Haney. Devin Haney. Now, here's the problem with young Devin Haney. Although young Devin Haney is really good and talented, their coach camps knows exactly and sees exactly what I see. And those are the risks on putting a fight against Subriel Matias. Because win or lose, your fight is going to take damage. And at what cause is it going to take you to win that kind of fight? How much is that going to take out of your fighter to pull that win off? It's doable, but at what cost? And are they willing to put Devin Haney in, in that kind of fight at this stage in his career? Although Devin Haney has been had a, an impressive career up to date, remember, he's not even 25, right? Is he 25 yet? He's a fucking baby. He's going to, you know, be like Kobe when he wore eight in the number 24, two halves of his career. We're legitimately going to see that with Devin Haney. Okay, so he's still so fairly young. Do you want to put him? Listen, here's a little secret. In boxing, this happens all the time. Have you ever heard the expression, age him out? Have you ever heard that expression? Devin Haney is young enough to avoid Subre Matias and age him out at 31. He can afford to skip past Subriel for four years and fight um, Subriel at 35. Devin Haney won't even be 30 yet. Yes, he can. There has been men that, listen, these promotional people and managers, they're not stupid behind the scene. They know how to do math and calculate shit out. And why you think that that phrase has been around in boxing for as long as boxing been around? How many fighters have done that same strategy when they had a younger fighter? They aged the other fighter out and then took the fight. It's happened a lot. Devin Haney is in one of those situations with Subriel Matias. You better believe it. If you start to notice that they didn't fight in the next calendar year, that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah, because they can do it. And at the same time, Devin Haney gets that much better. And all Subriel is doing is getting older. He's getting better, but he's getting older. And at 35, 36, that's when you, you attack the lion, the old lion, when he's getting older. Devin Haney won't even be 30. He'll be about 28, 28 and a half. Yeah. And he's in that kind of position. So these are the things that I see. You know that they protect Devin Haney a lot. And they should. They should. I mean, when you got a fighter like that, you know, you're going you're gonna to want to take care of him. But if you have a fighter like this, there's a difference. You don't have to take care of him. He can take care of himself. There's a difference. He's asking you, give me your best. He's never swayed. He's never said, no, I'll take a tune-up fight. No. He said, who do you have that is the number one best champion in the next weight division? Well, I'll take that guy. And then he did it again. And then he did it again. If you hit a shot one time, it could be luck. But if you did shit again, again, and again, that is no longer luck. And I have to acknowledge his dominance. He is truly doing some dominant shit. He has four weight divisions currently today. He's about to enter his, um, his fifth. He's about to defend all four belts. Yeah. Yo, listen, my people, if you love boxing and you love to see great fighters, 
put this guy on your list. Take it from me. Don't, don't do what I did. Don't, you know, man, I, I wish I would have watched his earlier fights live. I wish. I'm mad at myself for that because I, I, I read, I tried to read a book by its cover. I didn't give him the benefit of the doubt. I really didn't. And he turns, he's turning out to be probably the one of the greatest fighters I've probably ever witnessed. Well, one of the greatest champions. I've seen many different fighters. And that's just a broad, they, I just told, you just can't say who's the greatest and, and every aspect is for every different reason. But one of the best champions that I've ever seen with my own two eyes is this guy. I've never seen a champion like him, quite like him, ever in the sport of boxing. If you can name me one, I'll wait. If you can name me anyone that ever existed in the sport of boxing, and I'll give you from, let's take it, our measuring sticks would be like from the 1970s and now. I don't want to go to like, oh, when the last, let's say the last 15-round fight ended. Because I don't want to do those 15-round fights. Because those dudes were gladiators. You can't even weigh that against us. So that's kind of not fair. So from the last time um, the rule became 12 rounds, when the fights became 12 rounds, from that moment to present day, if you could find me a better champion, not a better fighter, I don't want to hear your opinion about this guy did a better champion. Okay, and his belt, you can't put interim belts against real world titles. Those are the standards. So if your guy has, you better check because I'll check. If your guy has an interim belt and you're misled and you're thinking that that's a real world title and you're trying to count it as a belt, it doesn't count. The only thing we're counting are the four major sanctioning bodies. What you pay money to. You don't pay money to the ringside and you don't pay money to the literal. They're not backed by anything. So they don't count. In fact, they don't count in the in the Hall of Fame. They give you acknowledgement for it because the literal championship is technically the people's champion. It's who we deem that you're the best type shit, right? And it's a prestige belt. But when you go to the record books, these are the only ones that count. So to make it the most simplest way, you can only, if, if he only has real world belt titles, you would have to lower the bar to put a, in, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put fake shit. That's like having a real gold chain on and putting a fake one over it and, 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 and comparing the two because the fake one's bigger. I don't give a fuck. That shit is fake. Period. So if he has all legitimate world titles, you have to put a champion against him that has all legitimate world titles. For instance, one of the champions in the world that was like right there with him was Felix, Felix Tito Trinidad. Felix Trinidad would have had like 21 consecutive world title fights. If he didn't take that one tune-up fight, fucking one fight. Yo, in a row, it was just consecutive world title fights. And then he has that break, and then it was all world title fights after that. Like that. Had he not fought that one tune-up fight, he would be that kind of champion. Because you got to put up real world titles against real world titles. And Tito, he might have only had one belt. But that's all you needed to qualify. You don't have to have three or four or two belts. You know what I mean? You have to qualify first. You got to maintain a belt consistently. It doesn't matter. That's the qualification. Then if you guys were tied, then they would go on who was the more decorated champion. And they would look at how many belts you had. Did you have two? Did you have three? Did you only have one the entire time? then he's the more decorated champion if they were tied, you see? But you got to qualify first to get in the conversation, see? So in order to get in the conversation against this guy, he's he has 23 world title fights in a row. 
you would have to fight 23 world title fights in a row to compete against him. Not 23 world champions. No, he only fought 13 world champions out of the 23 world title fights. Meaning, whether you were fighting him for his belt or he was fighting you for your belt, it's a world title fight. He has 23 of them consecutively. You see? So, it's 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 not up for debate. It's really not. What's up? How you doing, my brother? Yo, all right, my man. How you doing in the building? You guys have a lot to write about, and I'm over here just kicking it. I got to answer some of y'all questions. Now, I'll watch you one, one minute highlight. Yo. Wow, you guys got a lot. I got to answer a lot of shit here. What's up? What are you doing? How you? Oh, what's up, my member? We got to hit you off with the. Thank you for being a member at Round One Sports. I want to um um thank all the viewers and everybody tuning in. Give you guys a round of applause for tuning into the channel. Thank you for uh, watching it. And yeah, let's get right back to it. I know there's, there's everyone here in the channel, and I want to give you all a shout out. So thank you for everybody being here. And uh, let's get right back to it. So tell me, guys, and I know you guys probably been answering this. You guys think that um, Subria should uh, double back and fight um, um, Rivera? Or do you think that um, Subria Matias is in the type of position that he should just, you know, move on? And Naoya Inoue, you know, you see the things that I've talked about um, and him as a champion. You know, he's a really dominant one, um, champion and he has a lot of class. And when you see your fighter inside of the ring and you see him as a dominant fighter, that's what mostly attracts you to him, right? Okay. But what uh, one of the things that attracts me to a fighter such as this is what he does outside of the ring. The way he behaves. He's never in the in in the news for being arrested, for drunk driving, crashing his car, smashing his wife, doing drugs, testing positive for pee, banned substance. You know, he's you know, he's none of that. None of that. He's not over here. Have to make excuse. The reason why he popped positive is because he ate um tainted meat. He's not giving excuses. He's been criticized by a lot of people and some of the legends in the sport because they see that there's other ways of beating a man. And if they can cast doubt inside of the head about some of the ways that he, you know, what got him there. No, what got him there is his skill. It wasn't loaded hand wraps, as you can see, when Stephen Kubo Fulton allowed them to dictate how he wanted his raps. They was like, yeah, we want him rap like this. And um, Naoya Inoue's coach rapped them the way they wanted. Still, same results. Knocked them out. So it ain't loaded raps. It ain't no steroid testing. He He's always getting um, tested. He was one of the highest tested people at one time. And he enters himself into the steroid testing pools. The problem was they were appearing at his house at three in the morning. Waking up his kids. Who wouldn't be mad at that? Would you be mad at that? You just got your baby to sleep. And mind you, at the time, his babies, they were infants. I'm talking about his baby at the time, right, had to be, when he was one of them, had to be like under one or in between there. You just got the baby to sleep and these dudes knocking, we want blood and urine. It would piss you off. He said something in social media. Right away, they took off. Oh, he's complaining about stuff. He's hiding something. It got crazy quick, right? And then it didn't help when Floyd Mayweather himself came out and said that. Interesting enough, Floyd Mayweather criticized him for not coming out and not fighting more often out of Japan, which Floyd didn't even know himself. Um, because Floyd said he never fought outside of the Japan. At that time, he's fought outside of the Japan four times already. So that was bullshit, right? So Floyd doesn't know much about him. But it's cool that a legend can come out and say that. But if you're going to say that, you should have at least ventured out and fought somewhere else yourself at least one time, Floyd. 
you know, you guys do know this. Floyd in his entire boxing career has never ventured out the U.S. Ever. He's never ventured out into enemy's territory. He never fought anywhere else but United States of America. And at the tail of his, his career, he didn't fight anywhere else but Las Vegas. That's it. That's the only place Floyd fought in. Yeah. So how can you criticize the Japanese dude for not leaving Japan if you've never ventured anywhere? You never even left Las Vegas to go to fucking California. Never mind going to another country. What are you talking about, right? So if you let these guys tell it, you know, these guys will do anything to protect their records. And Floyd wants the Japanese dude to catch a loss because it would upset the cart, you know, and it also put uh, his credibility on the GOAT status. You know, there are a lot of YouTube channels right now throwing the word, uh, the word around GOAT because it's so throw, so often thrown around now in all major sports. You know, they throw it around in football. They throw it around in basketball. They throw it around in baseball. But when it comes to boxing, the real, real guys know. We all really know. You can't be called the GOAT while you're currently a boxer in boxing. It's, there's no way it's impossible. It's virtually impossible to be called a GOAT while you're active. Because um, I've talked about this. You can't be labeled a GOAT until you retire. Because some of these boxers don't retire well. And they come back and they start fighting in their later 40s and shit. And they're getting knocked out and knocked out and knocked out and knocked out. Would you call that guy the GOAT? After he's getting knocked out of the ring. Yeah, he fucked up his, his, his legacy by fighting and not retiring well. That's why a fighter has to retire. And when all is said and done and everything he did, once that's tallied up and he goes to the Hall of Fame, that's when GOAT status can be awarded. Because it makes him the most decorated fighter of all time. He didn't fuck up his career. In fact, this fight with um, Mike Tyson and Jay Paul, I wanted to look into it to see if Mike Tyson was fucking up his record even more if he were to take this loss against Jay Paul. And in fact, it's not. It's going down as an exhibition. So Mike's smart. Mike's not going to take a chance of getting another loss on his legendary record. You see? Because a lot of champions didn't retire well, like Roy Jones Jr., Nah, all those losses at the tail end, he's a much better champion than, than that, bro. You know, that I, um, but now Hoppington ruined his fucking legacy, bro. He would have went down as a much better champion, bro. There's been a lot of champions. Manny Pacquiao, if you ask me, ruined his legacy. Eight losses. Like, bro, at some point, you got to stop. And these some of these fighters don't know how to stop. And that fuck shit up. And they can no longer be called the GOAT because you now you got your fans arguing about what you, what you once did. Never mind the times he got knocked out. Don't look at that. Don't look at the eight losses. Yo, that's you got to. It counts. And to the real boxing fans, we know, no, you can't run away from that. That's why you can't call any of these guys GOAT. The only GOATs we got in our are our legends. And until you surpass them, you can't take that crown, puppy. I can't give it to him. Not now. Not now. It's a matter of time. Let's see where he ends up. But for right now, that's the fucking goal. That's it. So you're going to have to, like, beat these dudes. That's it. But that's how it is in boxing. You can't. You, you got to earn that shit in boxing. You can't just throw a couple passes or hit a couple home runs in a stretch of a season and a, and a moment in time. And, oh, shit, he's the GOAT. Nah, that's like, I, you know, I don't care how they pass around their GOAT or how prestigious they consider their GOAT. Because by naming everybody the GOAT or the next best thing the GOAT, your GOAT is um, kind of goes down. How serious is your goat if there's they consider five guys in your sport to go to as well? You're watering down your goat. The real goat. You're watering him down. 
went so fluently, you can give that title to anyone. Michael Jordan's GOAT status goes down every year by just shit talking. And they're not even close to beating him. And the real person that was the closest, why it is kept, are two fucking Lakers, Magic Johnson and Kobe. Both got five, five fucking trophies, legitimately. Right? No bench warmers, no bench warming trophies. Like, there's another dude that got like eight, but he wasn't really a fucking factor. So, like, you know, right? But the more they fucking gave LeBron that go status, Jordan's go status goes down every year. Now they're fucking killing it themselves. They don't even realize what they're doing. But not in boxing, bro. Not in boxing. Not we know it. The real boxing fans know it. No, you gotta earn that shit. What you think? You're gonna fucking come in halfway through your career, knock a fucking couple people out, and all of a sudden we're gonna call you the GOAT for what? For what? You ain't you ain't putting blood, sweat, and tears, a, a complete career unscathed. You want us to give you credit midway through your career? Nah, that's not how it works. Not in a warrior sport. Nah, our goats are prestigious. Oh yes, they are, and we gotta keep them that way. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep the goat status at a high standard in order for it to mean anything and for men to really consider it like, yes, that's who I am. You see what I'm saying? Yo, listen, Josh Taylor at one time was a good champion, and I'll admit that, but his fights till present hasn't been all that impressive. You know, Catterall, that that first fight, um, a lot of people said he, you know, they they gave um Josh Taylor a gift. They gave him a gift. And then on his next fight, he just gets wiped down. You know, Josh Taylor might have saw that he wasn't really living a boxer's life. And sometime behind the scenes, that's what can be happening. So it didn't look like he really fought tooth to nail for them stripping him. It didn't seem like he was willing to, you know, keep that status. It was like, he was like, oh, all right, you strip me. I'll still fight Tio. It, on some, it didn't, it, it, I mean, he argues and shit a little, uh, you know, he stomped. But to tell you the truth, he didn't look like that guy. And until that guy shows back up, like the Josh Taylor of old, you know, that's when Josh Taylor was like, you know, he was on a tear. He was on a tear. He was young. You know, uh, he looked faster. Um, he had a better bounce in his step. Josh Taylor has been a little bit more stationary in his last few fights. Um, I did notice that, you know, and I have seen a decline and um, his punch output, he's throwing fewer punches per round now. And I also noticed that. So those are kind of signs of a fighter declining. You see? So I was like, hmm, did we give Tio a little bit more than what he should have had? And then when you put him inside of a ring and the performance that Ortiz did to him, it really led for a lot of people questioning Ortiz's status. Because, look, man, uh, Ortiz, I think, won that fight. You know, it's not my fault you can't cut the ring off. It's not, that should be, instead of rewarded to Tio, it should have been held against him. Because he couldn't catch the kid. And that should be, speak to a hole or a flaw in your fighting. See, the one thing with Subrian Matias and all his other fighters, Ponce and them, they were on their toes. If you go back and you watch that fight, Ponce threw 100 punches in one round. In the first round, he threw 90, to be exact, he threw like 96, 97 punches. Total is what he threw. And he landed like a high fucking ratio of those punches against Subriel. And he was moving around, moving around. What did this Subriel Matia do? 
And what was his job? To cut the ring. So he slowed him down. So Briel Matias did the right things. He cut him off. He stalked him down. When he went like this, he stalked, boom, 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 boom. And he kept him over. And he, and he, and he battered him until he slowed him down. That is the same thing Tiafima Lopez should have been able to do against Jermaine Ortiz, and he wasn't able to do it. How are you going to award him the fight when he still didn't score no offense? You see? It was like, okay, a worse scenario would have been Shakur Stevenson against Edwin De Los Santos, where in that fight, a total... Combine between both fighters for 12 rounds, I believe they threw a hundred less than 150 punches. Combine both fighters, 12 rounds, their total punches together, 150. Ponce threw a hundred punches in the Subian fight in the first round by himself. He in the first round, he did. A 12-round fight with Shakur Stevenson and Edwin De Los Santos. In one round, his activity. To put it, to put it in its perspective. That the entire Shakur Stevenson fight, <laughs> you heard that correctly. And I'm tallying all of Shakur's punches and all of Edwin's punches. And I'm putting them together. Less than 150 punches the entire fight. All 12 rounds. That's a fact. You can look that up. Come on, man. You see? So, when you're like judging and you look back at some of these guys' career and you judge them as champions and what they did throughout their career, and that's what really determines of what they, he or she did, okay? Um, you know, right now, Terrence Crawford can enter the 154-pound weight division. If he was to pick up a belt in the 154, that would be four weight divisions for Terrence Crawford. He already has four weight divisions, the Japanese guy. He already has it. When he enters the 126, it would be his fifth. He has five weight divisions, men like him, okay? So that's when shit's going to get interesting. And I believe the year 2025 is going to be an explosion. And it, there's going to be an explosion because of situations like that. Mm -hmm. I believe that I prepared. I was saying to myself, I'm going to see, I think I'm going to see Terrence Crawford at 154 at the ending of the year winning a belt, being his fourth weight division and really raising the bar on the Japanese dude. Right now, they're side by side, one and two, and it's up for debate. You know, if you ask me, um, the Japanese dude has done more, okay? And he has, as for champion status, I think he has Terrence Crawford slightly, but I still think that Terrence Crawford has fought the the bigger, um, the, the more, like, Terrence Crawford has fought bigger names throughout his career than the Japanese superstar, meaning his fighters and Terrence Crawford's fighters were more recognized, right? So I, I wanted to see if that was a factor. Like, I wanted to see, is it was it because of the fact that I knew the fighters Terrence Crawford fought and I really didn't know who the Japanese dudes fought? Then I realized what the problem was. Terrence Crawford is fighting in a glamour division. Of course I'm going to know who he's fighting. It's the most watched division in all of boxing. It's probably the reason why I know it is because I watch it so much and some of the best fighters in the world are either north of the equator or south of the equator. So I'm more familiar with his division than I was with his division. So I knew that it was just a matter of names. So I really wanted to break down their opponents, okay, and how they were as individuals. Okay. In fact, the Japanese superstar, right, has fought some great champions and good fighters. 
But Terrence Crawford has fought the tougher level of opponents. He has. Terrence Crawford fought the who's who's of his division. He really wiped down that division. The Japanese superstar did wipe down the division, but he did it champion by champion. It wasn't like the way Terrence Crawford did it. Terrence Crawford did it. He took out like the number one guy, the number two guy, the number three guy, then the champion on that type shit. And then he went after that guy, knocked him out, um, knocked out a guy like in between that, then went and knocked and then got another belt. And then in between the time that he was waiting for Errol Spence Jr., it gave him enough time to clean out the division. Everybody that Errol Spence Jr. fought, Terrence Crawford went and beat too, which speaks to his level of champion. See, he really cleaned house. Not like him. He did it a little too good and a little too fast. That was his only problem, that he was he was doing it too good. And when you do something, he did it so good, in fact, he skipped by a lot of shit. He skipped by, like, the number one guy, the number two guy. Number, he just went right to the champion, you know. And, you know, that's not saying it, it shouldn't take away anything from him for doing that. For God's sake, he went to the best guy right away. You know, if you could do some shit like that. But Terrence Crawford really showed, like, a level of dominance through his divisions. Through the 140 and 147. He, like, brutalized the entire, and that's where I started to notice it wasn't the names anymore. In fact, it was the way that Terrence Crawford did it. And I think he recognized that. And he, as a champion to another champion, he said, no, I might have did it more impressively, but if you really want to look at it, Terrence Crawford, you did it the most impressive way. And I believe that's the only reason why he earned the Nioya Inoue's nod and respect as a champion and the number one pound for pound. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Edwin. I have been your host. Please, can I get some likes up in here on the channel? Am I not dropping it for y'all? You know what I'm saying? On Sports Talk, I love you guys. It's always been my pleasure. Listen, thank you for tuning in. I hope I gave you a great show. And I'm on to the next one after this one here at Round 1 Sports Talk.